Worker co-ops. What are they? And why are soy-sniffing socialists and jaywalking punk anarchists always squeezing themselves over them? They've been described by some as a cure for capitalism. But what is capitalism? I'm asking this somewhat seriously because if you ask three people to define capitalism for you, you'll end up with 17 different definitions. And most likely you'll end up with a kind of constellation of defining features. Private property, exploitation, credit, debt, markets, profit-seeking, and so on. The historical aspect, at least, is a bit less controversial. Most people will associate the beginning of capitalism with the Industrial Revolution, starting in the UK around 1760. You could also argue that this was preceded by about 400 years of capitalist prototypes, starting in 15th century Venice and Genoa and then later on in the Netherlands, but that's probably for a different time. But how many of these characteristics are really specific to capitalism? Markets existed for quite a long time before capitalism, exploitation of labour existed before capitalism, money, credit and debt all existed before capitalism, bankers and f***ing Jews existed for thousands of years before capitalism, just in case there's anyone watching who needed to hear that. So if I'm talking about an alternative or a cure for capitalism, I'm going to need to define exactly what that is. And because I can't help myself, I thought we could get our definition from Karl Marx. Part 1. The Theory Marx's Capital was written ultimately as a response to other economists of the time, particularly Adam Smith and David Ricardo. While Marx admired their work, he also found that there were a few critiques to be made. Specifically, he argued that they were being just a little bit too charitable to the system they were analysing, and explaining things like poverty, economic crisis, growing inequalities, as sort of errors or blips in the system. It's a line often given by economists today, who will respond to a crisis by essentially saying that this wouldn't have happened if things had been done according to my textbook. In Capital, Marx's approach was to assume that everything in the system was running in the way that economists wanted it to. That there would be no fraud, no cronyism, and most importantly, that everything was being sold at its true value. The book itself is frankly a pain in the ass to read, he repeats himself constantly, goes into really long-winded tangents where he comes off as more of an accountant than a theorist, he is a big fan of using six sentences when one would be fine, and it really takes about 300 pages before it starts getting to the really good parts. It's very turgid. <laughs> Thick. But those first 300 pages do have a very useful line of argument for defining capitalism, the summary of which looks a bit like this. I might go into all of this at some point, but for this video we really just need to focus on the end. Namely, the issue of how can a capitalist make a profit on their investment in an economy where everything is sold at its correct value? The answer, according to Marx, is that there is one special commodity that can achieve this. Labour power. The cost of labour power is whatever the socially acceptable amount is to keep that worker going until the next day. At one point this would have just been enough to cover a loaf of bread. At another point it would have been enough to cover a mortgage and enough to sustain a family of a wife and two and a half children. And nowadays it covers enough for rent and video games and avocados and shit. But that isn't the same amount as how much a worker can produce in a day. And if the amount they produce is higher than what is socially acceptable to pay them, then you have a profit. And if you're a capitalist, the only reason you'd ever hire a worker is if the amount of value they produce in an hour is higher than the amount you pay them in an hour. This means that in the realm of production, there are two groups. Those who invest in labour and means of production to produce a profit, and those who sell their labour in exchange for a wage. Worker and boss, labour and capital, employer and employee, proletariat and bourgeoisie. Did that rhyme? Huh. And here you have a bit of a problem. To put it very simply, the boss wants to get the most work out of their employees for the lowest possible wage, and the workers want to get the highest possible wage for the least amount of work. According to Marx, this fundamental tension between these two groups is the essence of capitalism. It's this tension that inspires bosses to bypass safety regulations, to automate their workers out of a job, to buy politicians in exchange for policy that benefits their business, to leave their wives stuck at home next to a big fucking pool and a grand piano that nobody plays, wondering if any of this is really worth it. It also inspires workers to unionize, to go on strike, to feel indifferent to their jobs, to feel powerless, to feel depressed, to spunk their wages on watered-down beer, cut drugs and fast food, 
to watch porn in the hope of fulfilling some voyeuristic fantasy of male control and domination that their pithy wages can no longer afford. To stare longingly at a picture of some blonde woman in a field with little blonde kids and a caption that says, look what they took from you, Western man. I don't know how accurate that last part is, but it sounds compelling. So the argument made by Marxists and socialists and all the other things, is that moving beyond capitalism has to mean overcoming this fundamental antagonism. To aim for a society where the primary purpose of production is to meet the needs of the many and not the few. Part 2. The Praxis So one solution to this problem that got quite popular in the 20th century was to replace private capitalists with state officials. I guess, in theory, the idea was that state officials would organize production and distribute profits on behalf of the people, even if those state officials weren't elected or accountable to anyone. Surprisingly enough, that didn't happen, and they ended up producing some of the worst societal failures in human history. Now, there is some contention over what exactly these systems should be called. Some call it state socialism, 20th century communism, bureaucratic state socialism, but my personal favourite comes from Lenin. In the early 1920s, Lenin argued that the Bolsheviks still hadn't properly solved the tension between labour and capital. All they had done was replace private capitalists with unelected state bureaucrats. And the term he used to describe this period was state capitalism. It was only after his death when Stalin would assume power and argue that communism had been fully achieved. But I am not one to judge people based on what they think of themselves, and personally, I think Lenin's description of the Soviet Union as state capitalism is actually quite a good one. Mostly because fuck tankies. But also because on a theoretical level, the fundamental tension between labour and capital still isn't solved here. An alternative approach was social democracy, which aimed to alleviate the problems of capitalism with things like progressive tax policies, a strong welfare state, social housing, increasing the minimum wage, unionization, and socialization of public services. The problem here would be that this still allows the tension between workers and capitalists to continue and only redistributes some of the profits towards the workers after the fact. Now that's not to say that socialists shouldn't be in favour of these policies. They should be. But what they're not, at least on Marx's terms, is anti-capitalist. So the issue for socialists in the 21st century is to find an alternative that doesn't simply replace one unaccountable boss with another. Which brings us to part three. Worker co-ops. Worker co-ops have existed within and around capitalism from as early as 1769. They were popularised by Robert Owen after he successfully started a cooperative cotton mill in Scotland. But what are they? I'm so glad you asked. A typical corporation is headed by what's called a board of directors. These are usually made up of 9 to 20 people who will decide what the company will produce, how they will produce it, and how the profits will be distributed afterwards. These directors will then hire managers to execute their directions, and the managers will hire employees to do the physical work. In a cooperative, every worker is also a director. This means that as well as doing whatever their normal job is, workers also have the power to decide how the profits are distributed, what the general direction of the company should be, and in a lot of cases, who the managers should be. I should stress that not all worker co-ops work exactly like that. The more accurate term for what I've just described is Worker Self-Directed Enterprise, or WSDE, which isn't to be confused with, number one, worker-owned enterprises, where the employees own shares in the business but aren't themselves directors. In this model, workers do get to elect the board of directors, but it's ultimately the directors who decide how much profit is distributed to the owners. In some cases, if they can get a good lawyer, they can get away with giving the owners nothing. Two, worker-managed enterprises. This is an important one because people often make the mistake of confusing directors with managers. Typically, managers as well as other white-collar professionals like advertisers, lawyers, lobbyists and researchers are hired to execute the demands of directors. These people might get paid a lot, but based on Marx's model, they're still workers. In the same way, Worker-managed enterprises don't fundamentally change the relation between labour and capital. Often, companies will encourage worker self-management because it increases workers' enthusiasm. Other times, they'll do it just because it's cheaper than hiring professionals. This is exactly what happened with Volvo in Sweden, when managerial rights were eventually taken away from workers when it was no longer beneficial to the directors. 
There are also other things like land co-ops and marketing co-ops that are very different from WSDEs, but I won't get into that. In this video, I'll just be referring to WSDEs as co-ops because that seems to be what everyone else does. And within self-directed co-ops, there are also different degrees of worker control. Some of them exist with no external shareholders, others have external shareholders but don't give them voting rights, and others that have external shareholders who are allowed a certain range of voting rights. There are some people who argue that the workers need to be directors and the full owners of a company for it to be socialist, but I won't be focusing too much on these differences because they do relate more to ownership than directorship. And the point about self-directorship is, is that it radically transforms the employer-employee relationship that is specific to capitalism. There's no proletariat or bourgeoisie because everyone is doing both at the same time. As Marx put it, the antithesis between capital and labour is overcome within them. Unfortunately, there weren't too many co-ops for him to comment on, but nowadays there are plenty, and the question of whether or not they work is fairly uncontroversial. They are currently the fastest growing enterprise on Earth. Profit isn't their primary aim, which allows them to flex more effectively in economic downturns. They're less likely to fire workers during economic downturns. They're more effective at fostering social trust and commitment amongst workers. When companies are fully worker-owned, they are a third as likely to fail as traditional firms. Research from Canada found that co-ops had a three-year and five-year survival rate that exceeded the national average, and studies from Italy and Germany found that they're less likely to declare bankruptcy. The fact that profit isn't their primary aim is especially encouraging now given the environmental consequences of endless growth for its own sake, but that might be for a different video. But that isn't to say there aren't flaws. I guess we need to talk about Mondragon now. Part 4. Mondragon. Mondragon was started in the Basque region of northern Spain in the 1950s by a Catholic priest and five of his students. In 1954, they opened their first factory with 24 workers and have since grown into one of the largest enterprises in Spain with over 80,000 employees. This tends to be the go-to example for co-ops because it's both worker-owned and worker-directed. When they're hired, workers are given the option to offset part of their salaries for up to 30 months before they become members. As members, they take part in social council where they can elect their own managers, take part in pay negotiations, and vote on key decisions of the company. The more broad decisions affecting the entire enterprise are made at a general assembly which occurs once a year. One of these decisions was that every co-op would have a maximum pay ratio, meaning that the highest earner in a co-op couldn't earn any more than seven times that of the lowest earner. In some co-ops, the ratio was as low as one to three. However, I should mention that these ratios only refer to individual co-ops and not the entire enterprise. In 2006, the president of Congress for Mondragon was earning nine times the amount of the lowest earner. The latest source I could find regarding ratios was from 2012, where 9 to 1 still seems to have been the highest. Still a fair improvement on the 1 to 320 ratio of the average American company, of course. And it's still the case that the low earning workers make more money than they would outside of Mondragon, and the high earners are still making less than their corporate equivalents. Chomsky himself described the corporation as partially socialist anarchist. Like take for example one of the most uh, successful industrial commercial installations in, in Spain, quite big in fact, Mondragon. It's a big collection of industrial works, uh, schools, um, you know, social systems, health systems and so on, very substantial, very successful. It's one of the few parts of the Spanish economy that's competitive internationally even after joining uh, European Union. It's worker owned uh, and it's partially socialist anarchist. It's worker owned but manager controlled. See, look, he, he did say that. But there are some problems. As Mondragon has grown over the past few decades, they have been criticized for a notable decline in workers' representation, and a growing rift not along class lines in the Marxist sense, but between workers and their managers. Workplace democracy is easier to execute in smaller enterprises, and this does inevitably get harder as a business grows. Mondragon is a relatively unique example because it operates across all three capital circuits. They have their own banks, their own retail outlets, and their own production units. In recent years, however, they've become increasingly technocratic with power being swayed away from the workers and towards the managers. In a survey from 1996, 77% of managers felt as if they were part of the firm, as opposed to only 46% of the workers. And across the different co-ops, there's also been an issue of unequal representation. 
some councils are much more active than others, and a lot of the managerial elections are not competitive. In 2002, a researcher described the general assemblies as more predictable than church services, noting that statements of opposition had to be reviewed before they were given. Sadly, workers who were not members were even less fortunate. Chomsky would later criticize the company for its treatment of workers, especially from outside of the Basque region. In 2011, they were accused of using sweatshop labor in a company they own in Poland, and they still have connections to very exploitative regimes in South America that would certainly violate their own ethical code to treat foreign workers according to company values. That said, it is important to remember what exactly these co-ops are being compared to. Because unlike in traditional firms, workers in Mondragon have still typically been able to block decisions that would have otherwise negatively impacted their lives. In 1991, a Mondragon management team was found conspiring to open up their co-op to a competing company, a move which was eventually brought to light and stopped by the General Assembly. In Chomsky's criticism of Mondragon, he argues that many of these failures are brought about by systemic pressures. After all, they are forced to compete in a global market with enterprises that typically have a lot more assistance from the state. For example, in 1958, when the Spanish Workers' Ministry excluded co-ops from healthcare and social security programs, they had to start their own co-op for that as well. Most advocates for co-ops would agree that capitalism won't be replaced just by building one co-op after another. The criticism Chomsky made is almost identical to one made by Rosa Luxemburg over a hundred years ago, where she said, Cooperatives, especially cooperatives in the field of production, constitute a hybrid form in the midst of capitalism. The workers forming a cooperative in the field of production are thus faced with the contradictory necessity of governing themselves with the utmost absolutism. They are obliged to take toward themselves the role of capitalist entrepreneur. Marx basically took the same position, arguing that cooperative labor ought to be developed to national dimensions and consequently to be fostered by national means. In other words, there would need to be massive political pressure placed upon the state to promote the growth of co-ops. After all, the Industrial Revolution wouldn't have been able to happen without the enclosures, where hundreds of thousands of peasants were thrown off their land by the king's army to make space for factories. In the same way, what we need today is, well, not enclosures, because fuck tankies, but policies. What kind of policies? Part 5. Vosh. The arguments I've been making in support of co-ops might already be familiar to some of you. That's because a lot of them have already been made by a YouTuber called Vosh. Hey, I know you! You're that jaywalking punk anarchist! Hi Vosh, uh, how's it going? Come here often? And I know some of you are probably out for blood, and I'm sorry to be disappointing. Because as far as I've seen, most of the arguments Vosh makes in favour of co-ops are correct. The criticism I want to make isn't that his advocacy for co-ops is wrong, but more that it's just a little bit incomplete. Specifically, I think his arguments tend to fall a bit short when it comes to the question of how do we get from here to there? If we want to see a world dominated by co-ops, do we wait for them to organically outshine their capitalist competitors? Do we seize the means of production with torches and pitchforks? Or, God forbid, are there policies we can point to that would support the growth of co-ops in a world dominated by capitalist power? And this is where I think Vos sometimes misses. There isn't much offered in terms of policy, and discussions often go down the road of the ethics of capitalism, or comparisons to slavery, or weird conversations about coconuts and dick sucking. Let me ask you a basic question, okay? Let's say that you are on a plane, and that plane crash lands on an island, okay? Um, there are only a few survivors. In fact, there are only two. And you wake up after the first one does. By the time that you have woken okay. up, the other survivor in this plane has claimed all of the coconuts on all of the coconut trees, stacked them on their pile, sheltered that pile with all the wreckage from okay. the plane, and declared sure. they own it. And they say that they would be willing to give you said coconuts if you throat their cock. Now, would you okay, consider that to be so a that's... voluntary interaction? <laughs> Is that a voluntary interaction? Okay. Now, I do agree with the sentiment here. I think it's perfectly fair to say that we live in what Durkheim would have called a forced division of labor, but I do get the feeling that trying to convince liberals and conservatives of the horrors of capitalism can often be a bit of a lost cause. Most liberals are already amicable to the idea of co-ops. After all, they do seem to realize liberal ideals of freedom and democracy far more effectively than traditional firms do. 
They don't need to be told how bad capitalism is so long as they already understand that co-ops are preferable. What they need is a convincing transitional period, and one that doesn't leave them shitting themselves at the thought of government officials seizing the means of production under an iron boot. Because they're liberals. They were tragically born without imaginations, and they can only envision the future as an extension of things that are already happening. They want policies. And I can forgive Vosch for not knowing about this first policy I'm going to talk about because it comes from a country that he probably hasn't even heard of before. That country, of course, being the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. In their 2017 manifesto, the British Labour Party introduced a network of policies aimed at bringing certain parts of the economy under worker control. Where the old Labour Party preferred to put industry into the hands of the state, the new plan under Corbyn was to democratise the workplace directly. As his shadow chancellor put it, the government wasn't going to take back control of these industries in order to put them in the hands of a remote bureaucracy, but to put them in the hands of all of you, so that they can never again be taken away. One of the policies was the Inclusive Ownership Fund, which aimed to transfer 10% of equity in British firms with 250 employees or more over 10 years, a policy which would have covered around half of the private workforce. This was effectively a more ambitious version of the Swedish Meidner plan, and would have also given workers the ability to elect a third of their board of directors. As we've seen earlier, this would have made the companies worker-owned rather than worker-directed. The workers would still be underneath their bosses, but they would have had a new level of control as minority shareholders. So, at the very least, a big step in the right direction. Probably their most radical policy was called the right to own, which stated that if a company is either being sold, dissolved, or floated on the stock market, workers would become the buyers of first refusal. This means that they would have the option, if they wanted to, to take over the company and run it themselves. This effectively would have given worker co-ops a priority over government support, which is currently reserved for traditional firms. Both of these policies, which were backed by the Institute for Public Policy Research, would have involved a massive shift of power away from bosses and into the hands of workers. What's especially crucial is that unlike social democracy, the effects of these policies would be very difficult to reverse. However, the Labour approach did have a very strong focus on converting companies that already exist. As for starting new cooperatives, and especially smaller ones, we should look to Italy. In 1985, in a period of rising unemployment and company closures, the Italian government passed the Mercora Law. Similar to the Labour Party, it gave workers financial and technical assistance to buy out firms that were closing, but it also went a step further. The law also gave unemployed people the right to take out a lump sum of their benefits as capital to start a co-op with a group of other people in the same situation. And I know what some of you are thinking, getting a bunch of unemployed Jeremy Kyle contestants together to start a business that's doomed to fail, right? Well, that doesn't seem to have been the case. The Mercora Law was a success. It was suspended in the mid-90s by the EU, and then reintroduced in 2001 with far less funding, and it still managed to succeed, even through the financial crash. Could it be the case that these bosses aren't necessarily as exceptional as people might think they are? Maybe. Part 6. Conclusion. I guess I should say a word about capitalism and socialism here. Co-ops do seem to wear down the tensions between bosses and workers, but there are very few people who would describe them as a silver bullet towards socialism. They don't offer an answer to things like land, housing, rent-seeking, or even the state. Corbyn's Labour Party recognised this, and worker co-ops were just one piece of their wider socialist project. Other things they addressed included social housing, public ownership of utilities, and even environmental regulations. Co-ops may not be compelled to grow in the same way that traditional firms are, but this only leaves the possibility that they'd be better suited to address climate change. Not that they definitely would be. Hopefully, I've given enough evidence of the kind of shortcomings they can encounter too. Mondragon is currently in the middle of an existential crisis, and it's very possible that their status as a democratic workplace could fade into a formality. But I'm not arguing for perfection here. The first examples of large-scale capitalist production in the 1700s were hardly perfect. Across the north of England, they dragged life expectancies down to levels that hadn't been reached since the Black Death. But their growth and development was necessary to getting us to where we are today. Likewise, co-ops have problems too. Albeit those problems don't include causing their workers to die earlier, people aren't being routinely branded or mutilated for refusing to work, and there aren't any kids at Mondragon being crushed by big f*** off cotton looms, so there is that. 
and despite their problems, co-ops should still be at the forefront of socialist advocacy. Not just because they cut to the heart of class struggle, but also because they're really easy to defend. The traditional firm is pushing 300 years old, and the idea that they'd be going out of date shouldn't really be a controversial one. Most people, I'd like to think, value the idea of democracy. And for whatever reason, it's become acceptable that principles of democracy are left at the door when it comes to the workplace. But the workplace is a massive part of social life. Most people spend quite a lot of their lives in a workplace, and as a society, we've left a democratic deficit there. And that's all co-ops are, an extension of democracy into the workplace. And I'm sure there are some people who would say that just sounds like liberalism, but maybe that's because liberalism and socialism aren't mutually exclusive. Karl Marx was inspired by things like the Paris Commune or the Christian Socialists, but he was also inspired by the Enlightenment, by the liberal ideals that spawned out of the French Revolution. Worker co-ops might resonate with socialist theory, but you could just as well align them with things like John Locke's labour theory of property, the idea that property rights hinge upon how much labour you exert upon it. I can't remember which theorist it was who said the only true liberal is a socialist, but honestly, I don't care. This is just semantics, and semantics are wank. If co-ops sound like liberalism to you, then call them liberalism. I don't give a f Call them fascist if you really want to. In the 1960s, General Franco gave the gold medal for merit in work to Mondragon's original founder. Mussolini's regime in Italy founded the National Fascist Cooperative Agency. F Everyone likes co-ops. Bye.